Well, turn in your Bible with me to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2 for this message entitled Models of Selfless Service, Models of Selfless Service. Today we're going to cover a large section which will bring us finally to the end of chapter 2. One of the core convictions that drives everything that we do at Hope Bible Church is uh, taken out of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or the person of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This is true of every portion and passage in Scripture, including our text for today, which on the surface seems like it's just a little more than Paul conveying his plans and who he's sending and the decisions that he's making about his ministry partners. In this text, Paul is not giving any theological instruction or ethical wisdom or addressing problems Uh, or deficiencies in the church. Nevertheless, it is a profitable text, and it's profitable in that it gives us the opportunity to learn from the examples of faithful servants of Christ. Learning from examples of servants of Christ is a key part of discipleship. In fact, later in chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says, Brethren, Join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. This is discipleship. A discipler is not just someone who has a conversation about spiritual truths with another person. A discipler is someone who models what it looks like to imitate Christ to someone who they are seeking to grow in Christ. And so after giving the instructions that he has in chapter 1, verse 27, to chapter 2, verse 18, and even though Paul gives us the supreme example of the Lord Jesus Christ, of that kind of selfless attitude that we need to cultivate toward one another, it helps to have models who can show us what it looks like to live like and for Christ, even as we are sinners saved by grace. And so what Paul does in this passage, chapter 2, verses 19 to 30, is talk about himself and talk about two other men in a way that enables us to make observations about them and learn from their example. So as we walk through this text, we'll identify five marks of a selfless servant. Five marks of a selfless servant. And let me give them to you up front. Then we'll read the text and walk through them. Five marks of a selfless servant. First of all, we'll observe that a selfless servant is concerned for the welfare of others. They're concerned for the welfare of others. Secondly, a selfless servant is content with the role God assigns. They are content with the role God assigns. Third, he is confident in the providence of God. A selfless servant is confident in the providence of God. And fourth, a selfless servant cares for the sorrows of others. He cares for the sorrows of others. And finally, as a result of those four, a selfless servant is commendable for their sacrifices. Let's read the text and then we'll walk through it. Follow along as I read Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. The Apostle Paul writes, "...but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly." so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow.' 
Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. About 800 miles divided the space between Rome, where Paul was, and Philippi, where the church was. And there was no way for them to communicate with each other except for someone to physically deliver a letter. It's been said that until 1804, going all the way back to the beginning of creation, no one had ever traveled on land faster than the speed of a horse. And so a trip from Philippi to Rome, which was mostly overland, though you had to cross the Adriatic Sea, overall that would take about a month with limited stops. And likely longer if you considered the fact that believers would uh, spend time most likely in the churches of other cities. Thessalonica, for example, was on the road from Philippi to Rome. And so no doubt as Epaphroditus and other believers would travel along that path, they would stop The churches of Thessalonica and Philippi were well known to each other, and so they would fellowship with each other as they passed through the city. So as Paul was deciding how to send this letter to the Philippians, he was thinking about the time involved. It would likely be a month, maybe two, depending on various factors that it would take to get it there. If he sent someone like Timothy that he'd like to get back, uh, it would take two to three months, if not longer, to go there and back again. And he also had to think about how that time frame related to his own situation, being on house arrest. You see, being a prisoner in Rome was not like being in jail today. Today, you would have all of your needs met. You would have food. You would have clothing, even if it was just one thing that looked the same every day. Uh, You would have uh, various activities, perhaps a library. In Paul's day, the Romans provided nothing for the sustenance of their prisoners, And especially being on house arrest, Acts 28 tells us that Paul was renting his own quarters in addition to the the basic needs of food and provision that his friends would have to provide privately. Not to mention, by the way, his legal case, which had to be dealt with. So his friends needed to supply for his needs, both legal, financial, and his daily provision of food. And so Paul was not only thinking about, how do I get this letter to you? Who should I send for that? But also, who do I need to to keep here to to minister to my needs? Add to this, thinking about who to send, uh, because no communication was possible between Paul and his representative, he had to choose someone who would fully represent Paul. Unlike ambassadors today, who can always call back to the home country to say, hey, what should I do in this situation? Whoever Paul sent had to operate completely on their own, and so Paul had to trust them fully. Imagine how destructive it would be if Paul chose someone who could get the letter there well enough, but their character and their conduct contradicted everything that he wrote in the letter. So the sensitivities of their situation, Paul's deep love for the Philippians, require him to choose selfless servants. And rather than just say, I plan to send Timothy later, but for now I've sent Epaphroditus and move on with his letter. He goes into a detailed explanation of who these men are so that the Philippians can appreciate who Paul is sending and, all, and understand his, his thought process and his decision. And so with that in mind, the first mark that we can observe of what a selfless servant is, is that a selfless servant is concerned for the welfare of others. They are concerned for the welfare of others. Look again at verses 19 to 21. He says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Christ Jesus. If you recall, at the beginning of this letter, Paul includes Timothy as a co-sender. And back in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. 
He does this not because Timothy is a co-author necessarily, though he probably was writing down as Paul was dictating the letter, but he does this for two reasons. First, Timothy is well known to the Philippians. In fact, every encounter that we know of that Paul had with the Philippians, Timothy was there also, and it's possible that Timothy had more encounters with them apart from Paul. And so Paul wants them to know that Timothy is of one mind with him in everything that he says in the letter. And the second and related reason is because Timothy, as he says, will be coming later. And so Paul wants them to uh, have in their mind that we're going to be accountable to Timothy when he comes because of what's written in this letter. Uh, when Paul first entered the city of Philippi about 10 years before the writing of this letter, Timothy, along with Silas and others, were walking alongside him. And although, as we know, the a well-known account of how Paul and Silas were thrown into prison and the earthquake and all of what happened there. Uh, even though that was true of Silas and not Timothy, Timothy was every bit as invested in the ministry of the church there. In fact, when, when Paul was in Ephesus in Acts 19, he sent Timothy and Erastus to, uh, into Macedonia, which is the region where Philippi was, to conduct ministry on his behalf. Again, that's probably one of those times when Timothy was engaged with the church apart from Paul. When it was time for Paul to leave Ephesus, he himself went into Macedonia, met up with Timothy and Erastus and others. They conducted ministry in various churches and ultimately in Philippi, out of which they sailed to other places. So Timothy was not just known to the church of Philippi, Timothy himself knew the church and had that same affection between them that Paul and the church of Philippi had for one another. This makes Timothy a prime candidate to send, but not yet, as we'll see in a moment. I want to emphasize the concern that Paul and Timothy have for this church. Notice how he says there, but I hope in the Lord Jesus. This is like saying, if the Lord wills, I hope to send Timothy to you. Again, though we know that Paul sends Epaphroditus back with this letter, and even though he has confidence that the church will respond well to his letter, Paul still wants to know the outcome of the situation. He's not a judge who just hands down a decision, has no relationship to the people involved, or has complete disinterest in what are the outcome uh, of the decisions that they hand down. As we've noted in the past, there's a deep love between Paul and the Church of Philippi, and so he's deeply concerned what their condition will be months from now as they receive this letter and apply the truths that are in it. Their welfare looms large on Paul's heart. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 that along with all the other suffering that he's experienced, he daily feels the weight of anxiety or concern for all of the churches. That would no doubt be true most of all of the church of Philippi, who loved and supported him more than any other church. In our day of modern communication, we have the saying, no news, excuse me, yeah, no news is good news, right? And we have the ability to send a text or make a phone call just to confirm that there's nothing of concern. Well, in Paul's day, you couldn't send that text. You couldn't pick up the phone. And so no news was just no news. Paul had to wait month after month just to find out what was going on in the church. And if things were going horribly wrong, it would take that much longer for him to respond via letter or visit them if he ever got out of prison. And so in writing this letter, Paul hoped to send Timothy as a follow-up because of his deep concern for the welfare of the church. All things considered, Timothy was the only qualified candidate that he could send who shares Paul's concern for the beloved church. You notice in verse 20, if you look there, that he says, For I have no one else who is of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. They are both equally concerned for the welfare of this church, not just because of their investment in the past, but because of their connection to the people themselves. In fact, the word concern there is the same word that's often translated anxious or anxiety. In fact, if you look over chapter 4, verse 6, Paul commands them, be anxious 
for nothing. That's the same word. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So do Paul and Timothy need to take a little bit of their own medicine? How, how can Paul say that he and Timothy are anxious about them, and then just a few verses later, command them not to be anxious about anything? Well, in Scripture, I think we all understand there is a distinction between proper concern and improper concern, or you could say righteous anxiety and sinful anxiety. It would take more time than we have to talk about all of those differences, but let me define it this way for our purposes. Sinful anxiety or concern fundamentally lacks trust in God, and it tries to control the uncontrollable, and it debilitates the worrier when they lose control. We are sinfully anxious when we see the potential for a problem, and instead of entrusting the situation to the Lord, we think and act like He has lost control. We also are sinfully anxious when we look at a situation and we try to, to grab to ourselves control over others and circumstances that, that doesn't belong to us. And we're also sinfully anxious when we become debilitated by our inability to control the situation. In the case of Paul and Timothy, they are well within the bounds of appropriate control here. In this letter, Paul describes the prayers that he prayed for them in chapter 1, demonstrating his fundamental trust in the Lord. He also provides godly instruction for them, uh, which is well within his responsibility and authority to do as an apostle. And he repeatedly tells them about the joy that he has and calls them to rejoice as well. So he is not at all debilitated by his concern. So their concern for the church is a godly concern. But we can also say that it's a godly concern because it's based on the interests of Christ. Did you notice that in verse 21? They, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. By implication, what we are concerned about for you are the interests of Christ Jesus. When you want for someone what Jesus wants for them, you can be sure that your concern is a godly concern. So then you have to ask, well, what does Jesus want for me and for others? Well, as we've seen, He wants our sanctification, that we would work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. He wants our unity, that we would walk together in love. And He wants our joy, that we would delight in the things that He delights in. We've seen those in those first two chapters. So this is what Paul is concerned for them. He wants their sanctification. Both he and Timothy want their unity and their joy. But again, note how Paul contrasts himself and Timothy with others. Again, he says in verse 20, For I have no one else of kindred spirit. And in verse 21, for they all seek after their own interests. For one who normally praises his fellow workers, this sounds like he's throwing them all under the bus. Is that what Paul really thinks of those who are around him, ministering to him, serving him? After all, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is with him, as well as others who care for him, not to mention the believers in the city of Rome who he praises highly if you read chapter 16 of the book of Romans. It's likely here that what Paul is doing is he's limiting his statements to those who are available to be sent. Not everyone is available. He wasn't looking at the entire church of Rome and saying, all of these people are selfish. There's just a small pool of those who may have been available to send, and of that small pool, none of them other than Timothy uh, shared Paul's concern. After all, as a historian, Luke himself, who again was with Paul, he was more of a secretary, just documenting what the Lord was doing through Paul. He wasn't necessarily a representative that Paul would send to other places. And we don't know who the others would be, but whoever they were, there is a little bit of an apostolic chiding in these words. It's clear that Timothy was not the only one other than Epaphroditus who could technically go. He was just the only one who was like-minded with Paul. 
and whom Paul trusted to have the Lord's interests at heart. Imagine yourself. You're there working with Paul, ministering day by day, bringing him food, helping him out with whatever his needs were. And then you learn that he didn't choose you for an important assignment because he says your concerns are not the Lord's concerns. You're more concerned about your life than you are about the Lord's kingdom. That would sting, I would think. Concern about our lives and the things of this world have the direct result of limiting our usefulness to Christ and our effectiveness in His kingdom. Even within the realm of God's sovereignty, we can hinder the kingdom by prioritizing temporal concerns over eternal concerns. And the selfless servant of Christ is one who is concerned for the welfare of others as an expression of seeking the interests of Christ. This is really what Paul commanded back in verse 4, isn't it? He said there, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So looking to the interests of others and the welfare of others is what we're all called to do. And Paul and Timothy model for us what a selfless love of the brethren looks like. Well, a second observation we can make about a selfless servant is that they are content with the role God assigns. A selfless servant is content with the role God assigns. Look at verse 22. But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. We've already taken note of Timothy's relationship to the church of Philippi, so we understand why they've observed his provenness. They've, they've seen him uh, behave faithfully uh, in their midst. But beyond that, they probably know about Timothy's reputation and other things that he had done for Paul outside of their interaction uh, with him. Uh, in fact, Paul first encountered Timothy in a city called Lystra, as recorded in Acts 16, which is really just months, uh, perhaps, before they went to Philippi. Uh, Timothy was the son of a Christian Jewish mother whose husband, a Greek, was an unbeliever. And by the time Paul met him, Timothy already had a, a good reputation among the churches in Lystra and Iconium. And so Paul discerned that he would make a good ministry partner, brought him onto his team. Timothy served Paul both in ministry of the word activities as well as in working to support Paul financially. In Acts 18, having left Timothy and Silas in Athens to water the the church that Paul had planted there, uh, Paul went into Corinth by himself. And there he worked during the week as a tent maker and preached the gospel on the weekends in the synagogues. Eventually, Timothy and and, uh, uh, Silas came to him in Corinth, and the text tells us that at that time, Paul devoted himself completely to the ministry, implying that Timothy took over the money-making efforts to support the ministry. In all that he did, Timothy proved himself faithful. Serving alongside Paul, he was the one Paul trusted to deliver and apply the apostolic letters to the Corinthian church and others. He sometimes stayed behind to further the work of the gospel that Paul had started in a city. Sometimes he would even go in advance of Paul to prepare the ground for Paul's arrival. Timothy was a preacher and a teacher, and he labored in whatever way was necessary to support the work of the apostle Paul. The record of the New Testament shows that Timothy was the most trusted and well-known of Paul's partners. In this way, until the end of Paul's life, Timothy was always subservient to Paul, subject to Paul's instructions and Paul's directives. Here in verse 22, Paul uses the language of a child serving his father. And remember that in those days, the child would work in the family business and do whatever their father told them to do until it was time for them to take over for their father. And all of this, there's no hint that Timothy was ever discontent in his role. We have no evidence that he despised being treated like a servant told to go there and come here and do that. Now, Timothy knew 
that all that he did was for the progress of the gospel. Whether he was working to support Paul financially or preaching alongside Paul, he was willing to do whatever was necessary for the sake of the gospel. In fact, until he became the pastor of the church of Ephesus years later, the only title he ever held was slave of Christ. Timothy himself had all the qualifications to go off and do ministry on his own, as he did later on at the church in Ephesus. He had all the gifts to preach. He had all the knowledge to defend the faith. He could have settled and served the Lord in his hometown or wherever he wanted. Instead, he was content with the role that God had assigned to him to serve the Apostle Paul and to do whatever Paul asked him to do. This is a model to me of verse 3 there in chapter 2, where Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Timothy had no selfish ambition. He didn't seek his own following. He wasn't trying to build up his own glory. He considered Paul as more important than himself, and he served faithfully as God had assigned him to do. Now, sometimes we can look at the gifts and abilities of others and have a gift envy, if you will, and wish we could do what others can do. Or we look at others who have the opportunity to serve in certain ways and think, I should be able to do that. In these and other ways, we can be discontent with the role that God has assigned to us. Now, it's not that we shouldn't aspire to greater roles. Paul's very clear in 1 Timothy 3 that whoever desires the office of overseer desires a good thing. So ambition is not necessarily a bad thing, but when we're discontent with our current position, even bitter in our own current role, when, when we can't benefit from the ministry of others because we think we should be the ones doing that, that is when there's a problem. And so Timothy here models for us how to be content and to serve faithfully no matter what role God assigns to us, knowing that no matter what role we have, we are serving the Lord. And the Lord rewards His people, not on the basis of what role we have or what results from our ministry, but He rewards us on the basis of our faithfulness to accomplish the task He's assigned to us. So a selfless servant is first concerned for the welfare of others, is second concerned or content with the role God assigns. A third observation we can make here is that a selfless servant is confident in the providence of God. Is confident in the providence of God. Look at verses 23 and 24. Paul says, Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. Paul here is confident in the providence of God. Though he has an idea of what will happen, certainly he has his own plans that he is making. He doesn't know the future, which is why he has to wait before he can send Timothy, but he is confident nonetheless. And there are times, unlike Paul's situation, where we are completely in the dark as to what, about, what is about to happen. But even then, we can be confident in the Lord, knowing that He is going to accomplish His good purposes in our situation. Now, when Paul says here in verse 23, as soon as I see how it will go with me, he doesn't mean as soon as I see whether or not I'm going to live or die, right? We, when we studied chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, we saw that Paul is confident that he's going to be released. He really has no doubt that he's going to win this legal battle. The word, the word trust in verse 24, I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. It's, it means to be convinced. But that doesn't mean he knows when it's going to happen. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. He doesn't know, for example, if the Romans are going to uh, lay down some uh, punishments for him like the Jews did to Peter and John and the apostles in Acts 5 before they let, let them go. He doesn't know if he's going to be released immediately at any moment. He just doesn't know. And until he knows, he can't make long-range plans, nor can he send Timothy, his trusted partner, away for long periods of time. But listen, instead of fretting about the future, 
Paul trusts in the Lord, as it says in verse 24. He knows that the Lord is in complete control and the purposes of God are being worked out perfectly. So whatever is going on in the halls of justice in Rome, God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. That is Paul's confidence. He conveys the same confidence in his last letter, 2 Timothy, which was also written in Rome, but years later, at the end of that letter that he knows, where he knows he's going to lose his life, he says this, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished. And that all the Gentiles, Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Now, interpreters are divided as to whether Paul is referring to his first imprisonment, wherein he wrote the book of Philippians and other letters, or is he referring to the first trial of that second imprisonment? That's, it's not clear what he means there, but what is clear is that Paul is confident in the providence of God. He said, the Lord stood with me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. So even though his situation looked dire and he was abandoned by his friends, the Lord used it to accomplish his good purposes, and Paul knew that's what the Lord was doing. Again, that's the confidence that Paul has here in Philippians 2. He doesn't know exactly what the Lord is doing or will do, but he trusts in the Lord that everything will work out in a way that will enable him to visit them in the near future. We all need to develop this kind of confidence, don't we? When life goes sideways, it's so easy to jump to the conclusion that everything is falling apart. We're like Israel in the wilderness, that whenever they hit a bump in the road or wherever they met resistance or hit a trouble that they didn't know how they were going to get out of, their instinct was to cry out, we're all going to die. And though you and I might not say those words out loud, what we might say in our heart or out loud is, what am I going to do? Well, what we should do is rest in the sovereignty of God, who does all things according to the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1.11, and who causes all things to work together for good, Romans 8.28, and who will not allow anything to come into our lives that He does not intend to use for His own glory, Romans 11.36. With those convictions, you, you can't be sinfully anxious you can make your plans knowing that the Lord will indeed direct your steps. And so Paul models for us confidence in the providence of God. And then he turns our attention, moving forward, to Epaphroditus, a man who is mentioned nowhere else in the Scripture other than in these particular verses. Uh, this is probably because Epaphroditus was likely a resident of Philippi, not one who traveled around with Moses. And he was sent by the church of Philippi with the task of delivering the financial support from the church to Paul, as well as perhaps ministering to Paul in whatever ways he had need for a time before he headed back home. Paul describes Epaphroditus here using five terms, three in relationship to himself and two in relationship to the Philippians. You can see them there in verse 25. The first is, my brother, my brother. This is true of all believers who have been adopted into the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and so Paul identifies him as such. The second term he uses is fellow worker. And by identifying Epaphroditus in this way, he's speaking that he's not just a, a courier, just a, a letter delivery boy, but he is a, a fellow worker in the kingdom of God. This may mean that he's a leader in the church, perhaps even an elder, but he is a, a worker in the kingdom. And then the third statement there is that he is a fellow soldier, a fellow soldier. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.3 to Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. A soldier was not just a worker, but they went further to uh, endure the rigors and the challenges of ministry. He defended the faith, 
endured persecution. And, and so in whatever ways Epaphroditus served the Lord with Paul and at the church of Philippi, Paul affirms here that he is a faithful man in the kingdom of God. The other designations Paul uses for him relate to his relationship with the Philippians, that he is their designated messenger and minister. The word messenger simply means that he is sent by the Philippians. Uh, and then uh, the, the word minister means that Paul was sent not only with money to, to convey information and resources, but also to care for Paul, perhaps taking some of the uh, weight off of Timothy for a period of time. It's unlikely that Epaphroditus was planning to stay for long. Again, he was not part of Paul's ministry team, so he likely would have returned to Philippi eventually. But the language here implies that his return to Philippi happened sooner than, than expected. Look at verses 25 to 28. Paul says, But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you." This is where we can pick up our fourth mark of a selfless servant, namely that a selfless servant cares for the sorrows of others. A selfless servant cares for the sorrows of others. I confess to you that if I had the opportunity to travel and spend some time with Paul, I would want to spend as much time as I possibly could. Epaphroditus, though, cared about the sorrow he assumed his brothers and sisters at the church of Philippi had upon hearing that he was sick. So he was not just willing to leave Paul earlier than expected, but he was eager to leave Paul and get back home so that he could relieve the concerns that they had about him. Based on what Paul says here, it's not clear when Epaphroditus got sick or what kind of sickness it was. Uh, did he get sick while he was on the way to Rome or after he had arrived in Rome? We're not sure. Uh, it's perhaps likely that it was on the way that he got there, but for, uh, so far along that it, he couldn't turn back. And we're also not told again of what the sickness was other than he di nearly died from it. And from our perspective, that would mean that this was a, a rather severe sickness, right? But perhaps not, because uh, remember back then, uh, a simple cold could kill you. Whatever it was, uh, however long he was sick, whether he was laid up in bed for days or weeks, it doesn't say. But the sickness seems to have delayed things such that there's a sense of urgency for Epaphroditus to get back. Now, by the way, we also don't know how the Philippians found out about the fact that Epaphroditus was sick. I mean, perhaps Epaphroditus wasn't traveling alone. Maybe he had a group of people going with him, and so one of those folks broke off and went back to tell them what was going on. Or perhaps as they're traveling on their way to Rome, they encounter someone who's going the opposite way to Philippi, and they convey news that way. We're not sure. But whatever the situation was, there wasn't an easy way to, to send the report about his recovery which implies that whenever he got sick, he fully recovered in Rome, and it was just too far of a trip just to send a health report. Again, given the times, we can understand why Epaphroditus would be distressed about the Philippians knowing that he was sick. If he were to die, which was very common, normally when you got sick, you died, it would be months before they found out. And we don't know, did he have family? Did he have a wife and children who were concerned about him? He didn't want their lingering sorrow and uncertainty to continue, so he was compelled to go back and bring them joy in light of his recovery. In all of this, listen, he cared more about the Philippians' condition, their sorrow, than about the privilege that it was to spend time with Paul. For his part, for Paul, no doubt he could have used Epaphroditus in a variety of ways. He clearly appreciated him and trusted him, but he too was concerned about the Philippians. 
And he decided that they needed him back more than Paul needed him to stay. In keeping with the theme of joy, Paul wanted to see their concern for Epaphroditus turn to rejoicing at God's mercy. And so again, in this way, we see Epaphroditus and Paul modeling for us, looking out for the interests of others above their own. You can imagine that it would have been counted a great privilege for Epaphroditus to be selected to to take uh, the letter to, to go to Paul with the finances. He no, no doubt would have looked forward to that. But that excitement of serving the Lord in that particular way soon was overshadowed by the care for the Philippians that he had. We might say in our day that he was people-oriented, not task-oriented. And so we can learn from this the priority of ministering to people above achieving our ministry plans. You know, sometimes we can get so focused on fulfilling the plans and desires that we have for ministry that we ignore the spiritual needs that are festering in those around us. Those of us who are in spiritual leadership are certainly susceptible to this. We can elevate the accomplishment of goals and, and projects and activities over the spiritual health of the people. We can be so concerned that things are getting done that we ignore the spiritual problems in people's lives. And so Paul exemplifies here that not that we have to be the ones to, to meet every need. Paul himself didn't have the ability to do that, but we have to be equipping the saints and releasing them to care for those in need. So may the Lord help us be more like Epaphroditus and Paul, who loved the Philippian church and cared for their sorrow above their own personal interests. Well, the final mark of a selfless servant is this. A selfless servant is commendable for his sacrifices. A selfless servant is commendable for his sacrifices. We've seen that a selfless servant is concerned for the welfare of others, is content with the role God assigns. A selfless servant is confident in the providence of God, cares for the sorrows of others, and finally, a selfless servant is commendable for their sacrifices. Look at verses 29 to 30. He says, receive him, receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. We saw the example of Christ in verses 5 to 11 who humbled himself. And as a result of humbling himself, the father exalted him above every name. And following that pattern, Paul urges the church of Philippi to exalt Epaphroditus in a manner of speaking. The word high regard there, hold him in high regard, is the idea of being valued or being distinguished, considering someone as a distinguished person or a highly valued person, an MVP, if you will. Some might think it odd. Why does Paul even have to say this to them? Wouldn't they appreciate Epaphroditus and all that they've done on their behalf for Paul? I don't think so. What Jesus said is true. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and in his own household. As much as the Philippians would have rejoiced to see Epaphroditus, that he was well and healthy, they would not likely have appreciated the sacrifices he made as much as they should have. After all, that's just Epaphroditus. He's one of us. Paul knows a thing or two about those who are faithful and unfaithful in ministry. And he knows that Epaphroditus is a rare jewel, a precious gift from God to himself, but even more so to the Philippian church. So he places his apostolic stamp of approval on Epaphroditus and exhorts them to have a high regard for this faithful servant. Now note the last phrase there in verse 30. He says, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. What was deficient in their service? Just this, personal touch. They had sent money, but they themselves couldn't be with Paul. Uh, Paul certainly appreciated the, the resources that they provided, but he missed their faces and their hugs 
and their laughter and the conversation and the prayers that they could share together. And that's what Epaphroditus was able to provide. Even in his suffering, Epaphroditus ministered to Paul in ways that the Philippian church could not. Whatever his sickness was, he refused to let it stop him from fulfilling the mission he had been entrusted with. And that kind of fortitude and perseverance is commendable. And more than being commendable, they should hold him in high regard. Now we can learn from this not to take one another for granted. When we see people in our midst who are serving the Lord faithfully, even at great cost to themselves, perhaps with suffering that's going on in their own lives, we should take note of those people and hold them in high regard. A few of us serve the church as our vocation, and because we uh, are upfront and well-known, we often receive a lot of praise and, and expressions of gratitude, and that's a blessing. But many of you serve the Lord with incredible faithfulness at a high capacity, with no remuneration, and in ways that people don't often notice. And so we as the church should do, would do well to take note of those individuals when we see them serving the Lord faithfully and hold them in high regard. And I would say this is especially true of those that we send out to the mission field. You know, we had just over a year ago, the Reesmans spent a year with us, whom we had sent out from our church to be missionaries in Togo. More recently, we sent Teresa Guillory out, who we prayed for today. Of course, we have other missionaries as well, but these, these two, you know, the Reesman family and Teresa, they came out of our church. And so when they come home, it's like, oh, hey, it's the Reesmans. Oh, hey, it's Teresa. And it's as though they went on vacation and came back. We need to learn to appreciate the sacrifices that they've made to serve the Lord on our behalf across the world. And we should hold them in high regard. In January, and on the 7th of January, we'll be having the Snyder, Stephen Leslie Snyder, who didn't come out of our church, but we've been supporting for a number of years. They'll be here. And it would be good for us to encourage them and to support them, not just financially as we do, but with our love and affection and our praise. Well, these are the five marks of a selfless servant that we should all cultivate in our lives. A selfless servant is concerned for the welfare of others. A selfless servant is content with the role God assigns. A selfless servant is content, excuse me, is confident in the providence of God. A selfless servant cares for the sorrows of others, and because of those things, they are to be commended, to be held in high regard for their sacrifice. These are all ways that we can not do anything from selfishness or empty conceit. But consider one another as more important than ourselves. These are ways, these are lessons we can learn that help us to live out what it looks like to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to adopt the humble mind of Christ, and to consider the interests of others above our own. This text sets forth for us Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, who are models of selfless service. So let us, you and I, consider how we can Imitate them as they imitated Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this word of exhortation, a word that doesn't explicitly have exhortation for us, but rather uh, represents faithful men of the past. And even as we think of Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, men whom we don't know, men whom we've never met, we can think of others in our lives who have modeled for us these same truths. We thank you for giving us examples, for working in the lives of your people who have gone before us that we can look to as examples and models. And Lord, help us to follow them, to imitate them as they imitate Christ so that our lives would reflect the goodness and the grace and the holiness of Christ, that we might shine your light in this world. For his sake we pray. Amen.